Hello friends! Last week we talked about the history of the Mennonites and how the Mennonite Anabaptists developed out of the Reformation and the splinter groups like the Amish and the Old Order Mennonites. So this week I want to talk a little bit about that history in the 16th century and how I have experienced that in the 21st century. There's 500 years between those days and who I am now. And I don't pretend for a moment to speak for all Mennonites because as you can imagine, that is a really broad range from the um, old order conservative to the modern Mennonites that look like me and have college educations and value, you know, all of these modern things and everybody on this, the scale in between. So Mennonite is a spectrum, you know, and so if you see somebody with a horse and buggy, that may be a Mennonite person, that may be an Amish person, and I am every bit as much Mennonite as a person. I am a cultural Mennonite as well as a spiritual Mennonite. And by the way, there are Mennonites all over the world because Mennonites have been doing service projects everywhere there's been disasters and people who needed help for those 500 years in between uh, then and now. So <laughs> there are Mennonites of every color, every tribe, every nation. So um, I happen to be a cultural Mennonite. I'm a descendant from some of those early guys, but that doesn't make me any better than anybody else. So uh, <laughs> it's... Um, it's, uh, it's a part of who I am, and this is something I've really enjoyed exploring. So let's talk a little bit more about some of those early beliefs. So Ulrich Zwingli and Martin Luther had uh, five basic things that they talked about. Salvation by grace, marriage of priests, yes, absolutely rejected they rejected transubstantiation very good they had an open lord supper i think that idea kind of changed in various later groups of mennonites but then the fifth one they rejected music and other fine arts in the church and so i think i think what that means is they rejected musical instruments and fine arts in the church and so through Mennonite history, what has developed is this amazing ability to sing in four-part harmony, eight-part harmony, pick a number harmony, a cappella music, and that's part of my heritage. And I was a part of a choir as a kid, and we traveled around and sang, and that was an amazing, just a really amazing experience. I think the, the act of singing with people and making beautiful music together gives you a sense of connectedness and gives you a sense of being a small part of a bigger whole. And both of those things are really good for your mental health. So I found it an incredibly positive experience and would do that again in a heartbeat. Um, I'm not a great musician. I love, to, I love to make music. I love to play piano and sing, but I'm not necessarily good at any of it. Um, but I do love that place of adoration of God that's found in music that just really speaks to my heart. So that is very close to home. I think there is an aspect of that rejecting visual arts and things like pipe organs and that kind of thing that is really unfortunate. Um, I only know of three pipe organs in the, in the Mennonite community. I hope there's more. <laughs> My husband is a pipe organ builder and I have come as knowing, learning to know him, come to really appreciate this art form. And it's sad to me that that's not so much a part of my uh, Mennonite heritage. But on the other hand, we've got that whole four-part harmony thing. So, you know, <laughs> I just, I think that for myself, with a calling as a visual artist, it's been hard for me to find my place in the Mennonite uh, neighborhood, so to speak, because I felt like being an artist wasn't something that was very valued. I felt like it was something that you only engaged in if you had extra time and extra money. It was only one of those things that you treated like a hobby. It was never, um, it was never uh, expected to be a calling, and that's how I experienced being an artist. So that has been kind of one of those things that I've had to come to the hard way because my cultural faith didn't really make that simple for me. But because I did come at it the hard way, and I did actually have to fight for it. And so I do come with a sense of, um, yeah, this is who I am. I'm an artist. I have a calling in my life to be a reflection of who God is, and God is the presence of all beauty. And so while that I don't think is an, a wildly held <laughs> Mennonite belief, that is something that's very precious to me. And pipe organs are amazing. 
just really want to put that out there. That, I mean, that kind of thing is... Uh, what my husband can do with a couple of sticks and some leather and some felt is phenomenal. <laughs> so, so I, I wish, wish my heritage hadn't been quite so strongly anti-art and anti-musical instruments. Uh, that's a really, that's a loss. That's a real loss. But I understand why it happened. I really feel like that was a reaction to the reality that these cathedrals were built while people were starving. So I understand why it happened. I'm just sad that it happened and that then there had to be that reaction. Uh, Zwingli and Grable talked about believers baptism and that became one of the fundamental aspects of being an Anabaptist, a rebaptizer, so to speak. They rejected infant baptism and instead said that baptism is for somebody who has made a profession of faith. You can't make a profession if you're an infant. So that was, uh, the Reformation was the birth of um, all of that Protestant approach to baptism. So totally on board with that. And I should maybe make the side note here that there are some things that are really foundational to faith and what I think it means to be Christian. And then there are some things that are kind of out there on this, where the, out there on this side, on the fringes, where you can really have a lot of interpretations of what the Bible says. So while it may seem really clear to me, somebody else may have the opposite perspective. And as long as we're still talking about um, things outside of the core aspects of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, then cool, have a multitude of approaches, that's great. Um, but, you know, when it comes to that faith, um, salvation by grace, that seems to be pretty fundamental. Um, having a perspective on who God is, who the Son of God is, and that Holy Spirit, that seems to be pretty foundational. Um, and having a, a theology of kindness, a theology of, you know, I mean, it exists in the Bible naturally, but having that as a value to treat people with kindness is seems to be kind of a foundational aspect of being a Christian. I don't, unfortunately, I don't think we always see that in practice, but <laughs> so yeah, there are some really foundational aspects to faith. And then there are some things that kind of come outside of those, that those boundaries, like for example, what you wear. Um, I'm not sure that that's a foundational issue. I think that's out there. And so I think there's a lot of variety and I think that's a good thing. Variety is a good thing. And then, uh, let's see, as things developed through Mennonite history, they rejected infant baptism. They believed in the separation of church and state, and I am all for that. I wish there was more separation of church and, and state because it seems like when those two are connected, there tends to be a lot of manipulation of people. And no, <laughs> not good, not cool with that. Uh, and then there's an, another foundational aspect of being Mennonite, and that is the refusal to take up the sword to defend themselves or the state and the following of the words of Jesus to turn the other cheek when somebody comes at you with violence to just to allow them to be violent against you and I don't know about you but that's a that's a <laughs> that seems very countercultural I mean I know that that American culture right now is is talking about how you need to present your uh, ideas for change in a nonviolent way but but it wasn't that long ago when everybody was banging the drum for war with Iraq. So culture can make big shifts on this. But the Mennonites have historically been a peace and justice church and not a God and country church, not a, a white nationalism kind of situation at all, but a peace and justice. Because out if there is justice, then there will be peace. And if there is not justice, there's nothing you can do. There will not be peace. So it's... Um, so Mennonites have culturally been people who served and who worked towards peace in all manner and shapes. Okay, in February of 1527, the participants drafted the first Anabaptist Confession of Faith, and it included these seven articles. Number one, it directed that only believers be baptized into the church, and I, I agree with that. 
Number two, the Lord's Supper be practiced solely among those united by believer's baptism. So in other words, if you hadn't been baptized, then you couldn't be a part of communion. Number three, Christians are to live a life separate from the sins of society. I, I think as being a part of a Christian subculture, being a, you know separate from the sins of culture is a kind of foundational. <laughs> Church members who unrepentantly return to a life of sin would be disowned by the group. And different groups take the whole shunning thing to different degrees. Uh, members further were to refrain from the use of force or violence, even in war. Were to take no oaths. Uh, the scripture says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And finally, the group of believers was to be served by pastors who would preach, preside at the Lord's Supper, and provide oversight and counseling. So what we're talking about there is a pastor, not like this crazy big hierarchy. <laughs> we're just talking about somebody who's going to preach and who's going to talk to people about how their lives are going and that kind of thing. So that seems to me to be very different than the whole hierarchical church levels of lots of stuff. Lots, it seems unnecessary. Uh, it seems really unnecessary. So... I think the one in there that is most intriguing to me is that idea of shunning people. And I think that's, um, I think that's a difficult one because the scripture does teach that if somebody is sinning, that you go and you talk to them about it. And then if that doesn't go very well, then you take a friend and then you go with them and talk to them about it. And then if that doesn't go very well, I mean, it, it kind of goes from there, but the end of that process is, um, that they would be, be an outsider to you, that you would treat them like an outsider. And um, I, I understand that's how the scripture works. I understand that's a principle there about when, when there's conflict that you go and talk to somebody about it. I kind of, you know, I get all of that. What I think is intriguing to me about how that has played out through the 500 years of history is that sometimes there's a difference of opinion on a finer point, and then this group think has the power of conformity to require a person to either conform or leave. And it may not always be on a foundational gospel kind of detail. It may be over something like dress or maybe something, you know, which is not foundational to being a person of faith. So what I think is troubling to me about that is that Conformity is powerful. It's, it's powerful in dominant culture, but when you, when you insulate a group from dominant culture to the degree that some groups are, and you require conformity to, as a um, membership, <laughs> you, have to, you, know, you have to check these boxes in order to be a part of this group, and the biggest one on the list is conformity. You have to be able to do as you're told, whether you agree with it or not. And in my opinion, that is really an opportunity for abuse because there is so much power in that request for conformity that, for example, if somebody wants to leave the church and even go to a different Mennonite church and not, you know, and <laughs> they would be, there's situations where people would lose their inheritance if they went to a different church. Um, if there's a disagreement between a parishioner and the bishop, and the bishop says, this is how it's going to be, and the person cannot come to a place of peace with that, then they're faced with losing their livelihood, with losing family connections. And this is a powerful tool to use against someone. And I would not for the world say it's always used in a holy way. So I think that to me is a troubling thing. This powerful use of conformity to require conformity in order to to as in order to solidify a group membership because if you are not prepared to conform to the group then you're out and that's powerful and unnerving and i think because those groups tend to be so separate from culture um, there may be the fear that i can't walk away from this group because i don't know how to live out there and there's over and over again this affirmation that anybody out there is, is wicked and we're the only true righteous. You know, I mean, they may not necessarily even believe that, but they may move in the sense that that's true, if that makes any sense. So it's, um, I think that's an aspect that's troubling. 
I think that's an aspect of being so separate that's troubling. things that, that I just is a little phrase in here that really caught my attention and that was that Mennonites didn't start looking different from dominant culture until about the 18th century and then there was this um, push to kind of keep everything the same and so so while men's fashions haven't changed a lot in the you know a couple hundred years since women's fashions have revolved and evolved so Mennonite women um, historically wore clothing that was really fantastic fabrics fabrics but a very but a very simple cut and we're going to talk more about this i've, I've got a a couple of research documents that i really want to dig into and talk about in the future about mennonite history in terms of clothing that but, through those 500 years of history that brought us to this point at the beginning this nothing was about the clothing at the 16th century Mennonites didn't look different from anybody else. In the 17th century, Mennonites didn't look any different than anybody else. In the 18th century, we start to see something develop. Well, here we are in the 21st century, and some Mennonite groups have a very distinct dress code, and you know the Amish may have a very distinct dress code, and then there's you know Mennonites like me who don't look all that different from dominant culture. So what happened? How did we get this dress, how did we get this fashion statement? And how is that for the women who have to wear the clothes? How is that play out? Um, what I think I gained from that, from dressing different as a child, was that I now feel more freedom to wear things that are not in style, to wear um, vintage things, to wear thrift store things. I feel no need to wear new clothes. I feel no need to wear the latest fashions or brand names none of that. I could not care less. As a matter of fact, I really genuinely do not want anybody's name on my clothes other than my own. And so that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of brand names I'm not interested in because if it's actually says somebody else's name, I'm not wearing it because I am made in the image of God. Why would I put somebody else's image of God on me? <laughs> I know I'm a little weird on that, but my Mennonite upbringing gave me a sense of ability to buck dominant culture if I need to, if I feel that's if I feel that sense of calling. So I think that's a really good thing. Unfortunately, I think sometimes it has become a this is this is our group and this is how we dress and if you don't like it, go. And that I think is troubling because the way you dress is not a foundational gospel issue. Uh, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Father, the Holy Spirit, virgin birth, uh, the, <laughs> the baptism, uh, confession of faith. You know, we believe in this core set of values. We are saved by grace. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus went away so that the Holy Spirit could be released. I mean, there are these foundational issues foundational principles that make up what it means to be a person of faith and a dress code is not in that list so i think we have the freedom as we follow along this path as followers of jesus to um, explore to express to uh, experiment i believe all of that is within the realms of this absolutely freeing journey of faith so while that whole old order Mennonite and conservative Mennonite and Amish method of dress may look a little bit different than dominant culture, I'm good with that. And to be honest with you, um, my old order and conservative Mennonite cousins are beautiful women. They wear clothes that fit them. They are um, never inappropriate. They never wear the wrong thing. And a well-fitted dress on a woman is always beautiful. And how is it that we got, you know, in this trashy, <laughs> these clothes that don't fit, that aren't made to last, you know, I mean, I mean, a lot of people don't know how to make a dress anymore. I don't, I'm not good at making a dress anymore. Um, dominant culture buys clothes and has no ability to make a garment that fits them. 
Uh, whereas in Mennonite and Amish culture, they make their clothes. They know how. They would be fine in a zombie apocalypse because they can make stuff. <laughs> and if, you know, if you've always ever only worn things that somebody else has made, then you might be at a slight disadvantage in a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> anyway, how about that for a rabbit trail? <laughs> Oh my goodness, yeah, I think um, growing up Mennonite has been a part of me, and for some reason it has really felt like an aspect of myself that I needed to um, experience more than just through passively being Mennonite because my parents were. It has been one of those things that I have researched and explored and researched and wrestled with. And so when I say that I am a Mennonite now, it's not because my mom and my dad are Mennonite and my dad's parents were Mennonite and my mom's father was Mennonite. It's not because I have this great cloud of witnesses of people in my heritage who are Mennonites. It's because I took some time and I wrestled with these ideas. I thought about them. Uh, I haven't always made up my mind on this one or that one or the other one, you know? I mean, it's like taking communion. Should that be only for people who are baptized or should that be for anyone? And can it be an expression of welcome? Can it be a opportunity to explore, kind of an oh, taste and see that the Lord is good kind of moment? Because I think there's room for that. The idea that the doors would be open to anyone at any time to take communion, whether they've made a profession of faith or whether they want to make that profession of faith through that communion experience. Um, I am, I think doors wide open is where I come out. Probably not the common Mennonite approach, but I think doors wide open is probably um, where I'm coming out on it. I think it's revolutionary to say not us and them, but we are in this together. And if you want to journey with us and this is how we uh, affirm our membership here, uh, go for it. You know, there's, there's room. This, there's room at the Lord's table for you, no matter who you are and where you come from, no matter what color your skin is, no matter what tribe, tongue, you know, any of the above, A, B, C, D, whatever. Um, this is a place of peace and you're welcome here. So, um, that's how I feel about it. So thanks for listening today. I really appreciate it. So my friends, like, if you like, subscribe, leave a comment, uh, always happy to have you share a video that you find here on my channel. Come along for the ride. I'd be very happy to have you as part of what I do here. Secondly, I do a live event every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern, and you are welcome to join in. I call it Weave and Mend, and it's a time where I sit at the loom and weave, and I welcome you to come and place your prayer requests in the chat box, and I will pray and weave. We can pray together about these things. So that, I think, is a really cool opportunity, and I hope you take advantage of it. Number three, check out the description for some playlists. One of them is my Being and Becoming vlog, and that's part of the series that I'm in right now. And that's just me talking about things I'm um, wrestling with, becoming, how I'm evolving, all of that. So I think that's kind of a, a journey. You know, come along with me for the journey vlog. And that the link to that is in the description. Also, there's a link to my podcast, the Faith, Art, and Tiny House podcast. And that's a, there's a playlist link to that. And also there is a link to the Smart Sexy Small House playlist, which is the house after the tiny house, which is where I'm at right now. And so you can see some of the projects that we've done here around the property. And uh, some of this really interesting, which reminds me, I need to do a video about the ring catchment system. That was a rabbit trail. Okay, so you, you'll find this playlist in the description. So I hope you'll check out some of the other good things that are around here. And finally, let me finish with a blessing. In your day of danger, may the Lord answer you and deliver you. May the name of the God of Jacob set you on high. May supernatural help be sent from his sanctuary, and may he support you from Zion's fortress. May he remember every gift you have given him and celebrate every sacrifice of love you have shown him. May God give you every desire of your heart and carry out your every plan as you go to battle. And when you succeed, we will celebrate and shout for joy. 
Flags will fly when victory is yours. Yes, God will answer your prayers and we will praise him together. Amen. God bless you and keep you. God keep you healthy and strong and aware of his presence at all times. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. You can follow me on Instagram at Carmen Rose Shank. You can subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Please do. And you can download us on iTunes. Theme music by classical guitarist Jonathan Crispin. Show notes available at CarmenShank.com.